Thanks very much. I'm not sure if it's completely correct for me to thank the organizers of the symposium, since I am one of the organizers of the symposium, but I think David has really put together such um, a wonderful day. And um, I am not a neonatologist. I am a critical care physician, although I was very close, very close to becoming a neonatologist, in large part because my first rotation here as an intern was with Dr. Sunshine, who was my first attending. Um, many, many years ago. Um, but I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit about our work, um, which I think dovetails uh, quite nicely with what Dr. Admin already presented. And we're um, interested in um, also how the endothelial cells promote lung growth, but also in looking at it in the reverse way, how the lung microenvironment really modulates uh, the angiogenic phenotype of the pulmonary endothelial cells. OK, I have nothing to disclose. Um, as has already been previously mentioned numerous times today, um, the lung is in some ways unique, um, because in contrast to many other organs which complete their development very early in pregnancy, a significant component of lung development does occur postnatally during alveolarization. And during this final stage of lung development, which begins just before term birth in humans, um, the division of primitive saccules um, by secondary septation allows for a dramatic increase in the gas exchange surface area of the lung. And as uh, Dr. Admin has already uh, presented quite nicely, growth of the pulmonary vasculature via angiogenesis during this time appears to be essential for alveolarization. And in animal models, if you directly block uh, pulmonary angiogenesis, it impairs alveolarization, causing the alveolar simplification that's characteristic of the new or post-surfactant BPD, as shown here by uh, seminal work coming from the admin lab. Um, but recent data um, has suggested that this period of alveolarization may extend for a much greater time postnatally than was previously recognized. I think um, Rory alluded to this as well. With new alveoli forming in rodent models um, through the first 60 days, potentially, and in humans, maybe the first decade of life. It's not completely clear. However, the majority of alveoli really do form during early alveolarization, during this period of bulk alveolarization, which, again, in rodent models, begins in postnatal day four. And concurrently, during this time, there's rapid expansion of the um, capillary network via a phase of active angiogenesis. However, as the new septa mature, the active angiogenesis slows, and this is followed by a period of microvascular maturation that in rodent models starts somewhere around P14 and probably within the first few years um, of life in humans. And it is during this transition where the vasculature really switches from a phase of active growth to one of remodeling. Um, where the double capillary layer um, that is characteristic of the early alveolar lung and is um, delineated here by these open triangles um, from a cast of the lung microvasculature from a, a rat pup at postnatal day four, fuses to form the single capillary layer that's characteristic of the adult lung. And this is, again, from a cast of the microvasculature from a rat at postnatal day 44. And al although it's relatively well accepted that growth of the pulmonary vasculature is an important driver of alveolarization, whether or not this phase of microvascular maturation represents a normal physiologic method, uh, mechanism that um, halts lung growth, I think is not known. However, what has been shown is that there are certain injuries that we know impair alveolarization, like um, steroid treatment to um, postnatal rodents, um, for example here, dexamethasone, which Dr. Job has already alluded to, um, which uh, is associated with a premature fusion of uh, the, these double capillaries to a single capillary weeks before that would be um, otherwise normally observed. And we became very interested in trying to better understand what mechanisms were really controlling the phenotype, the angiogenic phenotype, of endothelial cells during this particular stage of lung development, um, because we do believe that it represents not only um, a period of vulnerability, but also of opportunity, where you could potentially leverage strategies into new therapies to either enhance or preserve lung growth. 
And so in order to um, do this, we developed a method of isolating and studying primary pulmonary endothelial cells that we obtained from neonatal and adult mice at different stages in development. And to do this, um, we would take um, lungs from different age of mice, um, and we would first perfuse the circulation to get rid of any circulating hematopoietic cells, and then we would digest just the periphery of the lung tissue because we were interested in the microvascular endothelial cells. And this would give us um, basically single lung cells of mixed type. Um, we would then use antibodies, or magnetic beads, that were conjugated to antibodies that were specific um, for the endothelial-specific marker, CD31. And this would specifically bind the endothelial cells that we could then um, pull out from the group um, using a special magnet. And this is an image of the primary pulmonary endothelial cells that we obtained from a six-day-old mouse, so at the early alveolar stage of lung development. We only use very early passage cells, usually in the first first or second passage. Um, and you can see on the high magnification image, they um, demonstrate the characteristic cobblestone morphology of endothelial cells. We also did further characterization, demonstrating that the cells um, um, virtually all would express the endothelial-specific um, cell marker CD31, and none of um, them expressed the hematopoietic marker CD45. And what we first did is we just looked to see if there was a difference in the phenotype of the cells that we obtained from the early alveolar lung, from six-day-old mice, versus the uh, microvascular endothelial cells that we obtained from the adult. So the early alveolar cells are there in the yellow bars, and the adult cells are in the red. And we were first focusing on cellular processes that we thought were important in angiogenesis, survival, proliferation, and migration. Um, and so as you can see here at the yellow bars, again, the early alveolar cells were very resistant to apoptosis as compared to the mature cells. They proliferated more quickly, and they also migrated more rapidly. Moreover, we did um, assays similar to the ones that Dr. Abin already um, presented, where we looked at the ability or the number of cells present in each group that were able to clonally proliferate. And in these experiments, um, we serially diluted the cells and plated them at single cell level, and then counted the number of single cells that were able to form daughter colonies. And as you can see here, there is a greater, uh, approximately threefold greater number of cells within that early alveolar endothelial group that were able to exhibit um, clonal proliferation. And this clonogenicity decreases as alveolarization and lung maturation progresses. Um, in addition, there was a, a difference in the size of the daughter colonies that um, were formed with these early alveolar pulmonary endothelial cells forming larger colonies. And the size of the colonies also decreased um, with development. We became interested in one specific signaling pathway that we thought might be really important in modulating the angiogenic phenotype of the pulmonary endothelial cells. And this signaling pathway is called the nuclear factor kappa B or NF kappa B signaling pathway. And these NF kappa B molecules are transcription factors, and they're present in virtually all cells, but they are maintained inactive in the cytoplasm and activated by a complex of kinases that you see here, um, consisting of the kinases IKK, alpha, and beta. And upon activation, these nf kappa molecules can then very rapidly translocate into the nucleus where they are active, and they can regulate gene expression. And they're really most well known for their ability to regulate genes that are important in inflammation, innate immunity, um, but recent data is also suggesting that they're important regulators of angiogenesis, both physiologic and pathologic angiogenesis. And we uh, made the somewhat interesting observation a number of years ago um, that the early alveolar lung appeared to have a very high amount of endogenous nf kappa B activation. And this could be appreciated um, by immunofluorescent staining, where you can see a lot of purple signal that's originating from the red nf kappa B molecules that are located within the blue nuclei. And this was really in contrast to pre predominantly inactive or cytoplasmic nf kappa B staining in the adult lung. Moreover, if we administered a very potent pharmacologic inhibitor of the nf kappa B pathway to um, the early alveolar um, mice, we found that we saw a marked disruption of alveolarization. Um, and this was in contrast to no effect on lung structure in the adult animals. 
Moreover, if we just looked at the pulmonary endothelial cells that we obtained from the early alveolar and the adult lung, we saw the same thing. So for example, we saw by new, um, immunofluorescent staining that there was a high amount of nuclear active and of kappa B activation in these early alveolar endothelial cells, um, but very little nuclear staining in the adult endothelial cells. And this translated to approximately three-fold greater and of kappa B transcriptional activity when we um, assess this via uh, luciferase reporter assays. Moreover, if we blocked this endogenous activation of NF kappa B in the early alveolar cells, we disrupted a lot of angiogenic functions. Um, so if we treated the cells with a pharmacologic inhibitor of Bay using a higher dose of Bay, uh, seen here with the red triangles, the cells rapidly apoptosed. If we used even a lower dose of Bay, we impaired the cell's ability to proliferate. And if we used more specific strategies to silence the individual NF-kappa B activating kinases, for example, silencing either IKK alpha or IKK beta here in the orange and red bars, we impaired the ability of the cells to migrate and close a scratch in the endothelial monolayer. And so taken together, these data really suggested that endogenous activation of this pathway was important for promoting pulmonary angiogenesis. But real definitive evidence for the importance of this pathway in the, endothelial, um, in the endothelium and in lung development had really been precluded by the early embryonic lethality of global or even tissue-specific knockouts. So we've been spending the past couple of years um, creating a novel um, endothelial-specific deletion of the main NF-kappa B activating kinase, IKK-beta, that can be induced at specific time points in development by um, administering the mice either tamoxifen or the active metabolite for hydroxytamoxifen. And so the way in which we did this is we used um, a mouse, um, this PDGFB inducible Cree mouse. So this is a mouse that expresses Cree recombinase in an inducible fashion, so in response to either tamoxifen or for hydroxytamoxifen, but under the control of the PDGFB report, uh, promoter. So this is a gene that's predominantly expressed by endothelial cells. And we first crossed this mouse to a reporter mouse, um, this ZS green mice, where they would re um, express the fluorescent protein ZS green wherever Cree recombinase is expressed. And so what we first showed was that in the Cree negative progeny that were given tamoxifen, we saw no expression of the fluorescent protein ZS Cree in the pulmonary endothelium, which is stained here in red. And in contrast, in the Cree positive progeny, we saw widespread expression of the ZS Cree protein in the endothelium. We also did staining um, to stain the smooth muscle cells um, in red and confirmed, again, in the Cree positive progeny that were treated with tamoxifen that we had ZS green expression in the endothelial layer, but no uh, ZS green expression in the smooth muscle cell layer, again, suggesting that the driver that we were using was endothelial specific. So we then um, crossed again, this PDGFB inducible Cree mouse with mice that had the IKK beta gene floxed such that wherever Cree recombinase was expressed, the IKK beta gene would be deleted. And we showed that um, pups that were administered either tamoxifen or 4-hydroxytamoxifen in the first three days of life, that we were able to get effective deletion of IKK beta from the primary endothelial cells but maintained IKK-beta expression in the Cree-negative mice. And also that IKK-beta expression was similar in the Cree-negative and Cree-positive cells when we were looking in the non-endothelial lung cells. And we're still in the process of fully phenotyping these mice, but our early morph uh, morphometric data show that the Cree-positive progeny that received tamoxidone in the first three days of life have larger air spaces um, at post day 14 than the Cree-negative mice. And we also did experiments where, I'm, I'm sorry, and this um, corresponded to a decrease in the radial alveolar counts, which is a, a somewhat gross metric of the number of alveoli. Um, and we also did experiments where we put the mixed litters in 80% um, oxygen from postnatal day 0 to 14, and found that in the Cree-negative mice, predictably, there was an increase in airspace size and decrease in radial alveolar counts, but that this effect was exaggerated in the mice um, that um, had the loss of IKK beta from the pulmonary endothelium. And this is really the first genetic definitive evidence for the importance of this 
um, pathway for endothelial NF-kappa B signaling in late lung development. But we next really wanted to understand how it was that this pathway was activated at this specific time point in development. And we had two ideas. One idea was either that there is something just intrinsically different about the two groups of cells. And the second idea was that perhaps the cells were actually quite similar, but that they were responding to differences in the lung microenvironment. And so we did an experiment where we maintained the early alveolar lung in serum-free media for 24 hours, and we collected all of those secreted factors and added it to the adult um, endothelial cells to determine if we were able to activate NF-kappa B. And what we found was that the secreted factors from the early alveolar lung um, which we call early alveolar lung conditioned media, seen here in the yellow bar, did robustly activate the NF-kappa B pathway in these adult cells. And in contrast, if we took secreted factors from mid-alveolarization, P16, and this is again a period of time when angiogenesis is beginning to slow and microvascular maturation is ensuing, um, we had only a modest effect on NF-kappa B activation. And we had no effect when we added secreted factors from the adult lung. Moreover, and perhaps more exciting, um, these early alveolar lung uh, secreted factors or lung conditioned media also changed the phenotype of the adult cells. And we found that these secreted factors were as good as 5% serum in actually inducing the adult endothelial cells to move. And again, we saw very little effect when we um, did control experiments adding secreted factors from the adult lung. So this was exciting for us because we were able to see that potentially you could modulate the angiogenic phenotype of these endothelial cells, but we wanted to know then what was in it, what was in the secreted, fa the factors in the lung condition media that was, was having this effect. Um, so we did an experiment where we compared the early alveolar, the mid-alveolar, and the adult lung secretome using um, 2D difference gel electrophoresis. And this is a method where the proteins in the three different uh, secretomes are each labeled with a different uh, fluorescent protein. Then all the proteins are combined and run on a single gel. And so then you can image or compare any two signals, any two groups um, between each other, um, as is seen here by these three images. And this methodology allowed us to use a strategy where we narrowed down the hundreds of differentially expressed proteins in development by first picking only proteins that were exclusively expressed in the two neonatal secretomes, so that corresponded to only red dots on the first two images. And then from that group, they also had to be much more highly expressed in the early alveolar versus the mid-alveolar secretome, and that corresponded to either red or orange spots in that third comparison image. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about one specific protein that we found, which is located here. And by mass spectroscopy, we found that the identification of this protein is a protein called transforming growth factor beta-induced protein. So not TGF-beta-1, but TGF-bi. Um, and this protein is a really interesting protein. It, it contains a number of FAST domains, so it can be bound in the matrix. It also has an RGD domain, so it can bind um, integrins. And as you can see on these high magnification images of that gel, um, it appeared to be very highly expressed in the early alveolar lung conditioned media, but um, not at all expressed in the adult. And that resulted in a red signal when the two images were overlaid. So we first confirmed this differential expression of TGFBI in a number of ways. We did a Western blot on the original lung conditioned media and again showed very high expression at the early alveolar stage and really negligible expression at the mid or adult uh, lung conditioned media. And we also um, used composite um, analysis from uh, lung tissue at um, different stages in development and again showed higher expression at the early alveolar stage that decreased as alveolarization progressed. And we also stain for TGFBI in C2. Um, and the TGFBI here is staining red. And what we found was that in the early alveolar lung, there were numerous cells that were intensely positive um, for TGFBI. But in the adult lung, we had absolutely no staining for TGFBI. And when we looked on higher magnification images, it was really interesting because um, a lot of these really intensely positive cells were actually located at the tips of the secondary crusts. 
So we next did experiments where we neutralized out the TGFBI with neutralizing antibodies to see if it was mediating the effect of the early alveolar lung condition media to activate NF-kappa B and to promote migration. And what we found was that when we um, added uh, control rat uh, antibodies to the early alve alveolar lung condition media, it could still robustly activate NF-kappa B. But the addition of anti-TGFBI antibodies blunted this effect. Uh, similarly, although the lung conditioned media from the early alveolar lung containing the uh, control antibodies could still robustly promote migration of the adult cells, the anti-TGFBI antibodies actually uh, completely blocked the ability of this lung conditioned media to induce adult PEC migration. And we also did studies where we looked at the ability of recombinant TGFBI alone to induce pulmonary endothelial cell migration. And to do this, we used uh, microfluidic chemotaxis assays. And in these assays, um, this allowed us to have a source for the TGFBI on the right side of the chamber and a sink on the left. And this cr created a stable linear gradient of TGFBI within the cell chamber. We could then... Um, image the cells by live video microscopy and track the path of individual cells, and then create these directional histograms below where the size of each wedge corresponds to the number of cells that are migrating within that specific angular trajectory. And as you can see with starvation media, which is our negative control, the cells basically <coughs> migrated randomly, although there was a small nonspecific drift to the left. Um, with VEGF, our positive control, we saw that the cells exhibited directed migration towards the source. And with both the early alveolar lung conditioned media and with our recombinant TGFBI, we saw that the cells um, exhibited the same degree of directed migration. We also um, found that recombinant TGFBI alone increases the um, activation of NF-kappa B in the early alveolar PECs, increasing the nuclear staining for those NF-kappa B molecules, as well as increasing NF-kappa B DNA binding um, using EMSA, and this effect peaked at one hour. Um, and in addition, the um, TGFBI-mediated migration appears to be NF-kappa B dependent because when we studied endothelial cells from the mouse model that I described to you earlier, um, using cells that either retained IKK beta or um, were null for IKK beta, what we found was that the IKK beta null cells migrated similar to control cells in both starvation conditions and in endothelial growth media, but they were completely unable to actually migrate in response to TGFBI. So in summary, we think that um, the temporal specific secretion of factors in TGFBI, which we think is one of the factors, is important for activating the NF-kappa B pathway in the developing pulmonary endothelium and driving angiogenesis. And as maturation progresses, the loss of these specific factors and potentially the new expression of other anti-angiogenic factors helps um, maintain the adult pulmonary endothelium in a state of quiescence. Um, and moving forward, given that alveolarization is really continuing for a number of years of postnatal life, um, we really think that this is an, 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 a window of opportunity to potentially leverage some of these mechanisms into new therapies, not just for premature infants, but potentially for older infants and young children as well. And right now, we're really interested in understanding how alterations in the lung microenvironment and in response to injury really disrupt pulmonary angiogenesis and alveolarization. Um, and specifically in comparing the immature and mature lung, both in control conditions and in times of injury, as demonstrated here by this Venn diagram, with a specific interest in identifying factors that are normally present in the developing lung that are lost um, in times of injury, because we think this um, could represent additional pro-angiogenic factors that could be replaced in times of injury, but also to look at proteins that are normally expressed only in the mature lung but get inappropriately or prematurely expressed in the immature lung during injury because those could potentially be factors, anti-angiogenic factors that could be blocked therapeutically in order to preserve lung growth. 
So thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you about our work. Of course, I uh, need to mention all of the wonderful people, past and present uh, members of the lab, who um, have really done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, Min Liu um, has done a lot of the work with the TGFBI story. Shayla Jarrao has been creating and phenotyping the um, endothelial uh, specific knockout for IKK beta. And then Christiana Iosef, who's now a research faculty at University of Nevada, did a lot of the early work with the lung conditioned media. And all of our collaborators and the great mentorship that I had here um, with Dr. Rabinovich and also with Dr. Bland as well um, has been um, extremely helpful um, for me and for my career. So I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thanks very much.